chapter. Amen. For basic, it's brothers and sisters in Christ. And why I think it's so important is not only for the individual family program together, the brothers and sisters in there to see and relate with one another, where they may not communicate on a daily basis, but now they get to hear their story and where they've been and where they're coming from. It's also for the staff members, so we can see them for more than just a client. We get to see them as what they've gone through and what God's doing in their life. And so all together, it's just a very powerful service that we have. Um, we have four individuals today that are going to come in, two from the Esther's house, two from the Hope for Ben house, and we're going to start off with Miss Leslie. Good morning, church. Before Faith City Mission, I've never thought, let me write and present a testimony to the public. <laughs> I have the confidence and the honor to share the glory of my Heavenly Father and how He has saved me in His mighty works, with His mighty works. John 21, 25. Now there are also many other things Jesus did, were every one of them to be written, I suppose, that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. My name is Leslie Jasmine Garcia Maggi, born July 20, 1998. Childhood memories mostly begin at age five. My dad chose the world and what it offered. Rather than his family, my dad is an alcoholic and drug addict who loves dances, women, and when he was with my mother, would constantly lay his hands on her. I'm the youngest of three. My two sisters took all the abuse from my dad when he lived with us. My older sister helped raise me after my mom and dad split up. She cared and protected me. My mother did the most and best to her ability in raising her three daughters. In my journey, I find it astonishing how long it's taken me to properly decipher all the dysfunctional, little broken faith and amount of darkness my sisters, mom and dad, and I have carried, carried or is still carrying. In Acts 9, 15, 16, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument, of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I'm, in God's grace, my mother provided all we needed and at times even what we wanted. Growing up, my dad would call me once or twice a year. Getting my name mixed up with one of his other children, never calling on the actual day of my birthday. I knew all I desired growing up was a connection with him, a relationship with him, or at least some attempt of an explanation of why. Before 10 years of age, I experienced sexual contact. I took part in sexual acts, and it also was done to me. I never told my mother or sisters about these things. At 11 years old, I discovered pornography. Because of what had happened to me, I found out quick porn had my body responding. I had to repeat the fifth grade because of my focus on boys instead of my education. Embarrassment and shame were becoming a part of me, so I asked my mother to enroll me in a private school. She did. Expenses was too high that I needed to go back, or that I had to go back to the school I tried escaping from. I was baptized in the Catholic Church that same year. At 12, I found marijuana. I watched my sisters begin their journey as teenagers, with makeup, the way they dress, going out with their friends, getting ready for parties. My oldest sister is eight years, and my middle sister is six years older than me. In seventh grade, I gave my virginity away, began sneaking out, was an established pothead while messing around with promethazine. I was well aware in my family of females Neither one of us was open to discuss anything. We each had to figure it out as we went through life. With my mother being a single parent, I hid the truth a lot. 
creating myself to be an extreme liar. At times I had permission to go out with my middle sister. At 13, I'd go out to kickbacks and parties. My sister's boyfriend at the time had a homie who became my boyfriend. This man was in his mid-twenties. My flesh was already leaving. Barely a teen thinking, I know what I'm doing. I'm grown. No, I was still a baby. He invited me over to his house. We drank tequila. I was so drunk, he ended up taking me downstairs and raped me. When he finished, he dressed me only halfway, called the homie, and my sister showed up frightened. Finished dressing me up, took me, took me home, and no one ever spoke about it again. Since the man that took advantage of me wouldn't stop when I yelled and tried to push him off, who wouldn't respond rightly to the word no, the word no didn't exist to me. I dressed different to seek attention, slept with various men, ended up doing a few private dances. Instead of turning to the Lord, I believed seducing and giving myself to some men was a way for me to gain back control, feel superior, a way to run from what one man did to me. Doors began to crack open, too many secrets being kept from my family. I was only putting on layers and layers of face paint. I lost my identity. All my effort was being invested into being someone else's desire instead of my Heavenly Father's. 2 Corinthians 7.1 Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. At 15, I met my first love, Roberto. Later that year, I tried meth for the first time. 16 years old, I moved out with Roberto. Half a year later, living together, we had a miscarriage. <sighs> Almost three years together, we had our firstborn in 2016. Mijo was born with cystic fibrosis. Isaiah 53.5 but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. <clears throat> there was many weeks spent in the hospital with my son. God showed many miracles. I still didn't have a real strong relationship with Jesus. So much was happening in such a short period of time. My son experienced true love, true love as a son from mom and dad, and true love between his dad and me. There was times where drugs became a priority. Satan had a grip on me at one point to where my son was mirroring my movements while he was in a whole different room. His dad watched us for a few days and became terrified on what was taking place before his eyes. I noticed my boy getting sick really sick. I let go of the drug, cried out to my Heavenly Father for a week and was delivered and my soul was set free. Roberto and I had our second born son in 2019. We were living in Dallas at the time. Now both boys witnessed the beauty our family held. Picking up drugs again, the beast was unleashed. Sunny days turned to gross darkness. Outside family members knew what was going on. They would reach out, try to speak sense into us. But we already had years chained and shackled to addiction. We forced everybody to love us from a distance. In 2021, we moved back to Kansas. One day, Roberto, my sons, and I went for a cruise. Alcohol was involved. Since I wasn't driving, I was downing a bottle of Jack Daniels. The enemy had a plan behind, behind that. It was a good day. We all had a great time together. 10 minutes after we re arrived home, something was festering up inside me, a familiar spirit. The enemy reminded me of all the hurt, trauma, pain, fights Roberto and I had gone through. I swung and broke the bottle on the side of Roberto's face. I had completely blacked out, blood was everywhere. All this was taking place outside. The cops are called, and I went to jail. 
<clears throat> when I was released from jail, Roberto and I had split up. One, side, one son stayed with me and, their, and another stayed with their dad in Dallas. I didn't give myself the chance, the time to grieve a relationship of almost eight years. I was employed as a scale clerk, automatically classified myself as a better parent, paying off bills, taking care of business, running away from the hurt straight to alcohol. After a few months, I went to pick up my oldest son. I witnessed my oldest son so heartbroken, depressed, confused about how our family of four was missing one, their dad. All the emotions Miko was feeling, I felt too. But I learned at a young age not to unpack emotions. That if we're quiet long enough, maybe, just maybe, it'll disappear. So I went to find that false comfort, Crystal. The job as a scale clerk was only for the harvest season. When it ended, I had a lot of money and a lot of time on my hands. I decided I was, I decided since I was single, I'd control the drug use my way. I was spending more time with the man who could get me drugs. A day came where I asked my mother to watch my boys so I could go out that night. She said yes. One night turned to three nights. The month of April 2022, on night three, when I let my mom know I was on my way for the boy, she responded, don't bother, leave them with me. She already knew what was taking place. With the damage I was already doing and the more that would come from meth, I decided not to pick them up. I was a slave to addiction. Throughout the months, I would spend time with my boys, lots of time, but at the end of the day, I would take them back with my mother. No matter how badly I wanted to raise my boys, be a healthy mother to them, I couldn't. I was a puppet in the kingdom of darkness. For one full year, it continued on like this. Throughout that year, so much wickedness took place, so much torment in ways I hadn't ever experienced before. I knew that the Lord, and also knew, I knew the Lord and also knew him, knew that I was his. I've used that to my advantage and challenged the evil of the world. See, I believed I was justifying all I was doing because God's, because I was God's. But deep down I knew what, that that wasn't true. The whole time I was operating in the wrong kingdom. My God is loving and merciful that he saved me so many times. I was putting so much to the test. My God was keeping me safe all along. Jesus Christ showed me the path to take when I escaped sex trafficking. Jesus Christ led up the way when I was amongst cults and demonic entities. The Holy Spirit comforted me when I was being tormented, when it felt like weeks, months, and the fires of hell was on repeat. I was a woman going through this fight alone. I was pretending, or excuse me, I was partnering with demons in so many areas of my life without being fully aware of it. I used to enjoy having people in a place of fear. So much would go my way with the slightest sense of fear. It was a defensive mechanism. I felt I had everyone in the palm of my hand. I feel it's important that we all remember the scripture, John 10.10. 10. He comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. January of 2023, I finally was arrested. November of 2023, I joined Faces Mission. I've had people tell me, fake it till you make it, or just do what you gotta do to graduate. The truth is, is, I know my heart posture was infected. I was ready to make this change. I was so disgusted with all damage I'd done. For a long time, I had purposely ignored the Lord's voice. January of 2024, I lost all rights.
rights to both my sons. A major role in recovery is admit your faults. I admit I did wrong. You see, when one is getting closer to God, the enemy will throw suggestions at the mind. Ephesians 6, 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. By January of this year, peace, the Prince of Peace, was already living through me, that when I heard I lost my rights, I wasn't destroyed. <coughs> The blessing to God is, with the grace of God, my mother has custody of my children. My boys didn't get lost in the system. I will have the chance to raise my boys again once I'm established. The Lord put it in the judge's heart not to send me to prison. For the course of six months, I have been renouncing inner vows, breaking covenants. In the name of Jesus, I've been... <clears throat> have been loosed from bondage. Chains have been broken. I have, been, I have rededicated my life to the Lord and was baptized this year, 2024. <clears throat> Acts 9, 18. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. And he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. In the name of Jesus, I am the generational curse breaker in my life. Through, through prayer and interceding for my entire family, I pray that my father may burn me and my family, my entire family, burn us beautiful, burn us lovely, Burn us righteous and burn us holy. <laughs> Struggles are still there. Some people think just because I'm a new Christian, I'm to sin no more. No. Now with any kind of temptation, I have the knowledge to surrender it all at the foot of my of Jesus' feet. It's not mine to carry. Even if it's down seventy or even if it's done seventy times a day. My father is so good to us. He will take it completely away. Just don't pick it back up. Through the grace of God, I am delivered and I am set free. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to welcome my Christian brother, Scott. Good morning. The story begins, like lots of other people's, with shameful and traumatizing experiences. In Isaiah 54:4, do not fear, for you shall not be ashamed, nor humiliated for your shame, for you shall not be put to shame, for you shall forget the shame of your youth. I carried a lot of shame that produced insecurity. I was committed to no one except my own free will. As I got older and had a family of my own, my selfishness caused a lot of problems. It opened doors that I didn't want open and blinded me to the fact I was hurting my family. I thank God for the gift of desperation and that, I, and that I still had the ability to make a choice, to make a decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God as I understood Him. To, to trust God when He told me, I know the plans I have for you, plans for peace and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I needed a breakthrough. And as I was recent, and as I had recently learned, I had a lot of anger built up, and I didn't know how to deal with it. As early as I can remember, I was getting beat by a close family member, and if that wasn't happening, I was being made fun of, picked on, and judged on on everything I did. I had a lot of resentment, and I didn't realize that this was the cause of my addiction. This caused me to be shameful. I didn't know this until my meetings with Wally. A breakthrough was knocking on my door. I needed a relationship with Jesus, and this doesn't happen by reading a book, but by believing and obeying and knowing who the God I'm serving is, having a relationship with the Word of God. But there is an enemy out there who tries to destroy me at every turn, and he's ready for battle. With his arrows, he knows what to shoot at. With bullet on precision, he shoots at things like my depression, my self-esteem, my self 
self-control, my anger, bitterness, frustration, my unforgiveness, and my addiction. All the things that were keeping me in bondage to him. And in August 2018, I buried my dad. In 2020, I buried my oldest son, who was 26 at the time, because of diabetes. And in December 2023, I buried my mom. The enemy's arrows were on point, hitting the heart of my soul. Uh, Ephesians 6, 16 says that above all, taking the shield of faith, that I will be able to extinguish all the fiery arrows of the evil one. I will glorify my God. I have the power and authority over the enemy. I am redeemed Amen. through the blood of Jesus and forgiven of all my sins according to the riches of his grace. I am born of the Spirit of God, and I am filled with this Holy Spirit. Yes. And I walk in the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, yes. gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. A breakthrough is all around me. A breakthrough. I am a breakthrough. I am a child of God. My heart is the tree, and the words I speak are the fruit. You will know me by my fruit. And when the enemy comes to me and asks, who do you think you are? I can say I am who I am. I am a child of the great I am. If I'm going to follow somebody, I need to know who that somebody is. And if all I want is Jesus, and if all I want is Jesus to be my shepherd, he will provide all my needs and wants. Jesus makes me to lie down in green pastures. Jesus leads me beside the still waters. Jesus restores my soul. Jesus leads me down the path of righteousness for His purpose and His name's sake. Yes. Scripture says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will speak back to the Lord, and I will say, The Lord is my shepherd, my yes. refuge, my fortress, my God, and whom I trust. Yes. I pray that my heart lines up with the Father's heart, and that His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. 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 Hello. Um, I want to begin by saying the start of my story is a lot of ugliness and darkness. However, God's light will always shine through. First Peter two nine. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. This is what my testimony truly is about. It's to bring glory to the Lord. Psalms 51:13. Then I can show other guilty ones how loving and merciful you are. They will find their way back home to you, knowing that you will forgive them. I've never done public speaking like this before. However, if my testimony can help one person, it is well worth it. <laughs> my childhood wasn't the best. My father was, and still is, a very damaged person, and he would belittle me. My mother tried her very best, but back then, she had not yet accepted God as the word of her life. Because of this, I didn't know of God or believe in him. I was a very good child. My only issue was I struggled with depression. At the age of 19, I had my first boyfriend. This relationship was my first of many toxic relationships. He was very abusive, and he ended up violently raping me. This caused my depression to severely worsen. I started using weed to numb, along with sleeping around with many men. At the time, I didn't know who I was, and I thought having a man gave me purpose. I met Brad when I was 20 years old. We would date for a few years. We were potheads together, but he also introduced me to shrooms, ecstasy, and cocaine. After another relationship failure, I decided to move back home to Iowa. I was upset about having to restart my life again and continue to numb with weed, alcohol, pills, and cocaine. I was living in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, when I got a job at Little Caesars. 
A lot of my coworkers were recovered addicts off of meth, and they would often talk about it. I didn't know what meth was yet, and even though they didn't smoke meth anymore, they would drink and do acid. I would often hang out and drink and party with them after work. One night after hanging out with them, they had a friend stop by and he needed a ride home. They asked me to give him a ride and I agreed. He ended up introducing me to meth. I did nothing but smoke for three days straight. I ended up meeting another guy eventually on the street and I ended up dating him. I would rarely go home and stop going to work. My mom was concerned for me, but I didn't see it like that at the time. <clears throat> Within a week of doing meth for the first time, I was homeless and had lost my job. I ended up being homeless for about a year in Iowa. Towards the end of this, I met Marlon. He had an apartment and he took me off the streets. Uh, we were in addiction together. We dated and lived together off and on for about a year. During this time, I became pregnant and Marlon threw me out on the street. I decided to run away from my problems like I always have. I moved back to Texas from Iowa. I had no family here and was back on the street. I couldn't stay sober. My addiction continued to worsen and I went from just smoking to shooting up. I was so full of darkness, my worst fear was accidentally killing my unborn child. I hated myself and would self-harm. Towards the end of my addiction, I was planning suicide. When I was on the street, I would come to Face City to eat and the watchmen would welcome me and they learned my name um, and they would tell me about the program, but I wasn't ready for the change yet. Um, over time, the watchmen, uh, they would pray with me. At the time, it was Joseph, but mainly, that would pray for me. Um, and I believe that's what led me to accepting God. The Holy Spirit led me and empowered me to join the program. In the five months I've been here, the Lord has restored my relationship with my family um, better than it's ever been before. I had a healthy baby girl. Amen. Yeah. Who I can now show the proper way. Um, I can teach her the Lord. And um, she will not grow up like I did. Um, he took away my depression and my self-hatred. He gave me identity and purpose. Yes. <laughs> I'm still healing from all my trauma, but I have come a long way. The Lord is beautiful and patient with me. I'm also so thankful for Faith City Mission, for taking me in off the street, for not just saving my life, but the life of my baby girl. They continue for, to provide for me and my baby. I know that this is God working through them by the Holy Spirit. I have some scripture. Romans 12, 21. Never let evil defeat you, but defeat evil with good. Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the Lord's name will experience new life. Proverbs 17, 3. In the same way that gold, that gold and silver are refined by fire, the Lord pur purifies your heart by the tests and trials of life. And Psalms 147, 2 through 5. He gathers up the outcasts and brings them home. He heals the wounds of every shattered heart. He sets his stars in place, calling them all by their names. How great is our God. There's no, absolutely nothing his power cannot accomplish. Amen. Thank you. And um, Cody Parker. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm 
old, so this may take a minute. Oh. <laughs> uh, September 2nd, 1975, a disciple was born, Mark Cody Parker. Um, whenever I was very young, at the age of five, my dad used to let me keep my skull can in his toolbox out of the garage. So I was introduced to nicotine at a very young age. Um, one time after that, at age nine, I asked my grandpa for a sip of beer. He said, no, go get your own. And that started, started a whirlwind of addiction. Whenever I turned 12, my grandpa put me to work as a full-time cowboy. I worked on the J bar, Rock and P, the D, and even broke horses for the sixes on the summertime, during the summertime. At age 13, Emerald was a rough place to live and uh, produce some rough people. I got introduced, introduced to hardcore drugs at age 13. Um, due to that, I was uh, arrested and put in prison at TYC out here north of town. And uh, TYC was a very rough place at that time. Um, things went on there that weren't very good. When I got out, I was on probation for a couple years and my probation officer said, either you go back to TYC or you start rodeoing to get your life straight. So I started rodeoing. That was really not a good idea because I was young and all the people I rodeoed with were a lot older than me. And uh, they taught me into doing some things that 15 year olds shouldn't do, like drink beer and sit around bars all day. My girlfriend at the time had been my best friend for a couple of years, and me and Joe lost our first child at 15. I wasn't ready to be a dad. So uh, I packed up and found an ad in the newspaper here in Amarillo for a Ramuda Wrangler, and uh, that's a horseman and I flew to Pennsylvania with a saddle and a duffel bag and saddlebags thrown over my shoulder. I drove a wagon train from Franklin, Pennsylvania to Uvalde, Texas, where I was, when we come through, come through Oklahoma, I was very proud of what I was doing. My parents came and took all kinds of photos. And, you know, I just thought I was bigger in life. And then whenever I got home, my girlfriend at the time had my son, Rowdy. Rowdy was five weeks old. I packed my bags and moved to Dallas because I couldn't be a dad. I was not ready. When I moved to Dallas, things got real crazy. I uh, tried to cover up being who I was raised to be. I was lucky my dad and my mom were good people, but I just had to live. And, uh, uh, my, I met my wife at age 20. Her name was Troya. We were engaged for two years. She had two little boys that looked up to me and called me dad. It scared me, so I ran. My daughters were born from a different woman. Three years later, I had Dusty Rain, who was born addicted to cocaine. She was so small that I just... I could hold her in just the palm of my hand. And uh, I thought it would straighten me up, but it didn't. Eight months later, I had Cody Dawn. Cody Dawn was born addicted to cocaine, and she was even tinier. Both, luckily, both of my daughters are healthy, going to college. One of them just got married. <laughs> but once again, I wasn't ready to be a dad. I've always been Uncle Cody to everybody. Since I was a very young man, everybody called me Uncle Cody. <clears throat> because down deep inside, God had something in store for me. I was a protector. I was a keeper of people's souls. I would make sure that single moms could pay their rent, put my money to good use, but I never kept any for myself. I. Uh, did bad things to try to gather up enough money to help people out. The bad thing was, is I stole copper. I wound up in prison. Prison wasn't good for me. 
Uh, it was hard. Um, I went in thinking one way and came out thinking another. I learned in prison that God is love. No matter who or what told me hate was better, I knew in my heart that love was first. And so I chased that. A year later, I was doing my 12-step program. And the first person on my amends list was my fiance from 10 years earlier. I called her up and eight months later we were married. I got the girl in my dreams, 200 pounds heavier and a lot older and wiser. We had a great marriage. I worked a lot. I worked jobs that kept me away from home a lot. And uh, her family started getting <coughs> sick. So I stayed home and that was a problem because out of the hands of the devil's workshop and I know that from experience. I brought drugs into the house and uh, in 2022 we got a divorce. I went to go see her to hand her the divorce papers and she asked me, Cody, why are you drinking? You were so much fun when you were sober. 2020, 22, November, that's when Cody Crazy Parker died. I uh, quit drinking, but I just couldn't put down the pot. January of this year, <clears throat> I went to my dealer's house and asked for a large amount. He gave it to me, I stuck it in my pocket and cleaned his garage for a week. And at the end of that week, I gave him back what I bought. Didn't use a drop, and I knew I was ready to get clean. In 2023, I was reborn and facing the mission. You know, there's a, I didn't write it down, but there's a scripture in Romans and it's asking for God, why are you so hard on me? Your little servant, just let me die. And I didn't realize what that meant until just a while ago listening to the other people here. He did let me die, thank God. Yes. God let me become completely broken before working on rebuilding me into the great man I know I can be. Just a year ago, I had everything, but still wanting more. So I thought I could fill that void with women and chemicals. God showed me that that was just a pipe dream. I lost the truck, the house, the beautiful women, but I still had more to lose. I lost the respect of my business partners. And all the material things that I had accumulated before I found a mission, but wait, I wasn't done. I lost my family and now I'm losing my health. But in the end, I was in a place full of people and friendships that would never happen anywhere else. So that I had, uh, excuse me, sorry. I had support because I was turned into a lump of flesh with the guidance of the staff here and the fellowship of the disciples, men and women both. I feel I will finally be able to let God mold me into the bad to the bone man I know I am. And even the great disciple I feel I can be. Now with all the people in this room, I have the tools to heal the wounds that are there and build up my armor so I may take what I have and share to the masses.
Father, I just thank you for this day that we get to come and just, just be in awe of your goodness, Lord. Oh, thank you for the work that you're doing in, in the lives of the people that spoke today, the people that shared. And I thank you for the work that you're doing in everybody else in this room, Lord. Let it be a reminder of your goodness and your faithfulness and your love for us, no matter what we do, no matter where we've been, that our hope and our future is in you. So Lord, let us let us not forget that as we leave and we go about our, our, our duties and our business for the day, Lord, that we would just stay in that place of awareness of you and your presence with us, Lord, and that, that you've created us to reflect that light to those around us, and that you would get the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.